This is CBC Here and Now. Good evening, I'm Carolyn Stokes. We start here and now tonight with details of a stop work order at Muskrat Falls. It happened earlier this week. Occupational Health and Safety issued stop work orders to two contractors on Sunday. Here and now is Jacob Barker is in our newsroom and has been following this developing story. So Jacob, what can you tell us? Yeah, Carolyn, well, what I can tell you is that we don't really have the full picture right now from Nalcor, but what we do know is that workers were sent home from the powerhouse on Sunday, and since then they have returned uh, to work on the site, but on different aspects of the project. And what I'm told is that this has to do with work that's being done within the powerhouse relating to the turbines and the generators, specifically Turbine 1. According to Nalcor, parts of the Muskrat Falls project are now being energized and it says in energized environments that requires more diligence than non-energized environments. Nalcor says it's now conducting safety reviews and some of the work that has been and some of the work has been stopped while those reviews happen. Here's part of the most recent statement from Nalcor. It says we are working closely with our contractors and the regulator to restart the work that has been impacted and will provide an update once all work activities identified in the order resume. Uh, so just what uh, sparked those uh, reviews and just what happened, we still don't know, but we have asked Nalcor and Occupational Health and Services uh, to let us know a little bit more about what happened, some of the details and we're waiting for those calls back. Carolyn? Thanks, Jacob. That's here and now's Jacob Barker reporting from our newsroom. Well, the man accused of killing Chantel John in Con River faced a judge today. Kirk Keeping was brought into provincial court in Grand Falls, Windsor for a preliminary inquiry. That's where a judge will decide if there's enough evidence to send him to trial. About a dozen friends and family of Chantel John drove from Con River to see the proceedings. They were met with extra security measures in the courthouse. House. The inquiry will resume in mid-December. Workers at the Bay St. George Long-Term Care Center in Stephenville Crossing are fed up. There is a shortage of personal care attendants, licensed practical nurses, and no relief workers. They want mandated overtime to end and staffing levels improved. Here now is Troy Turner explains. No more mandated. No more mandated. David Clothier worries about the care his wife receives here. He lives in the Codroy Valley, but he travels to Stephenville Crossing to visit her. She's a resident of the Bay St. George long-term care facility. The union representing workers is raising concerns about the conditions, and today they held a demonstration. About 40 people attended. Employees are complaining of working 16 to 20 hour shifts with only an eight hour break to follow. Clothier shares their concerns. Because there's no place here at in this facility for an employee that works 16 hours to have a rest before going, have a rest before they start their next shift. They have to go home. So that's, that's not fair and I don't think it's, I don't think it's legal because you're putting people on the road that you could be putting their lives or other person's lives in danger. Clothier says he took his concerns to management last year. He knows the workers can only do so much. It's not fair to the, to the residents and it's not fair to the employees because they want to do a good job and they want to do whatever's best for the residents. CUPE has asked for help from the health authority and the provincial government. The union has a solution. We've been asking government to do an LPN course in Stephenville, which would help provide some relief staff in that for us. So we're here today asking government to put a course off in Stephenville as soon as possible. Western Health would not talk today, but said it would do an interview about the situation Friday. So what's next for the employees and the union here at the Bay St. George Long-Term Care Center in Stephenville Crossing? Well, ultimately, they want this problem fixed and they want it fixed soon. The next step for them, they say, is a request for a meeting with government, and they're hoping that will happen in the coming days. In Stephenville Crossing, Troy Turner, CBC News. There are so many people in western Newfoundland who want to use the facilities who are a family of two. Is a single mother and her child a family? 
and should they get the family discount? Coming up on Here and Now. A mild day for parts of the West Coast. Your temperature is reaching 12 degrees in Corner Brook, uh, 9 degrees in St. John's today. Even though uh, we're sitting around seasonal for this time of year, those gr gusty winds this afternoon making it feel a lot more chilly uh, than that thermometer saying. So we've got 41 kilometer per hour sustained winds right now. The good news is we should start to see those winds ease as we head through the night tonight. Uh, we seem to have escaped the showers uh, for most of the Avalon as well. Still anticipating we might see a few showers as we head through the overnight tonight. Uh, enjoy the warmth tomorrow because we do have a cool down. I'll have all the details coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Well, the books have officially been closed on the 2018 2019 fiscal year. And while the province is still in a deep hole, the final numbers are not far off what was expected. Here now's Terry Roberts joins us live from our newsroom with the details. Terry. Uh, yeah, well, Carolyn, well, you remember uh, back in April, that was before the provincial election, Finance Minister Tom Osborne gave a revised deficit for the 2018 fiscal year. That projected shortfall at that time was about $522 million. Well, the final numbers are now in, and the numbers are, uh, you know, it's millions of dollars higher than, uh, than what was projected. Now, here's how it all breaks down. So the audited financial statements puts the deficit at more than $552 million. So that's an increase of $30.6 million from what the finance department was forecasting back in April, but far below the $682 million deficit government was predicting when budget 2018 was originally tabled. So how was government able to shave $130 million off that original deficit forecast? Mostly you can thank higher income from the offshore oil industry. That swelled our total revenues to more than $7.8 billion. That's a half billion dollars more than the year before. But our expenses were also higher than projected. More than 2% in fact over last year, coming in at $8.4 billion. It's that jump in expenses that has the opposition up in arms today. I think that it's trending in the wrong direction again. We have continued to see an upward trend in our expenditures. And let's not lose sight of the fact, while they're talking about a $30 million difference, actual expenditures went up by $100 million. And over the last five years, they've continued to go up. Yeah, so uh, Wakeham says, look, it's fortunate that the revenues are going up, but he says this additional money should be used to reduce those deficits. Uh, meanwhile, the finance minister, was uh, he was uh, defending that extra spending today, saying it was really in line with the rate of inflation, and he turned things around once again on the Tories, saying the Liberals are still trying to clean up the mess left by the Tories. Our legacy as a government has been reducing deficits. We've done it year over year over year. Uh, I'm not going to take lessons from an administration who their legacy was putting our deficit over $2 billion and, and providing the, the province with a boondoggle uh, that uh, puts jeopardy uh, to the people of the province in terms of increased borrowing. Our, our direct and indirect debt, uh, won't, over one third of that is directly attributable to NALCOR and in large part Muskrat Falls. You know, so we're focused on fixing things, and that's what we're going to continue to do. We've got a yeah, so Osborne, as he said there, he's, they're still striving hard to try and balance the books, but he also admitted once again today that that's not likely to happen in, within the next couple of years as planned. Carolyn? Thanks, Terry. That's here now. It's Terry Roberts reporting. Well, time to check in with Jeremy Eaton at the Public Library tonight, where a group is hoping to beef up the province's Wikipedia profile. Jeremy. Yeah, so what you're looking at now is a Newfoundland and Labrador Wikipedia edit-a-thon. Now, this has been put off by Newfoundland Quarterly, the Center for Newfoundland Studies at Memorial University's Library, and also the Newfoundland and Labrador Public Libraries, where we're standing here at the Arts and Culture Center. So what they're trying to do is uh, teach people how they can upload stuff to Wikipedia and, as you said, try to uh, fill in any gaps for the arts and culture scene here in Newfoundland and Labrador. Now, we're going to talk to people from Newfoundland Quarterly and the library coming up. Carolyn? Thanks, Jeremy. 
Well, a teen in western Newfoundland has been sentenced to 12 months probation for threatening to shoot up a school. His identity is protected because of his age. The teen threatened a younger student over the phone, saying he'd bring an AK-47 to school if the younger student didn't pay for a damaged vape. While there was no evidence he would have carried out the threat, a judge says it caused significant fear and anxiety. The boy has been banned from possessing any firearms or ammunition for five years. He was previously convicted of several motor vehicle thefts, damaging property, and carelessly using a firearm. The judge noted the teen has taken responsibility for his actions and is attending school. Well, the province's English school board is trying to get students to stop vaping. There have been a number of vaping-linked deaths in the U.S. The board says the number of young people in Newfoundland and Labrador using e-cigarettes has risen over the past two years. Teachers and staff are now trying to start a discussion with students about the dangers of vaping. Over the next week, all students from grades 7 to 12 will learn about vaping. Well, the tech sector in this province celebrated another big win today. Breathe Suite, a startup with a solution to problems with inhalers, has received $550,000 in private funding. As Here and Now's Ryan Cook reports, it's another sign that within the local tech industry, the kids are all right. It's a room full of established professionals in suits, businessmen and politicians. And they're here for 23-year-old Brett Vokey, a young man with a fresh face, a fresh degree, and a half million dollars to help grow his business. Thank you all for being here, uh, and we're, we're hiring. <laughs> this funding is the latest success story for the local tech sector and the youth movement within it. Vokey saw a problem. About 90% of people using inhalers are using them wrong. He created a device and a matching app to track how people are using them to ensure they're doing it right. It actually requires quite a bit of coordination, so it's actually not that surprising that people are using it incorrectly because it's quite difficult to use them in the first place. Um, so our, our device is going to essentially track all of those steps, um, give the user feedback in, in a, mo a mobile app, and, and hopefully train them to get more medication to their lungs. Voki says they'll use the funding to grow their team from five employees to at least ten, and they're looking for a pair of software engineers right now. Breathe Suite got its start at the Munn Center for Entrepreneurship under director Florian VMA. It's another success story along with startups like Colab and Misa. In fact, MCE was just named one of the top five emerging entrepreneurship centers in the world. We are very proud as a team to what uh, has been accomplished by uh, those startups and we wish uh, them all the best and I'm sure they're going to change the world. Voki is hoping this money will help them crack the U.S. market and get their product on shelves soon. It took a lot of, I guess, hard work, but um, you know, we're, we're really excited for, for what's, what's happening in the future. Ryan Cook, CBC News, St. John's. A single mother says a western Newfoundland ski resort is discriminating against a type of family, single moms with one child. But Marble Mountain is doubling down, saying its policy is clear. Only families of three qualify for family passes. Here now's Mark Quinn reports. What exactly is a family and who gets to decide? Organizations that offer family passes are forced to make a definition. Here's what Marble Mountain calls a family on its website. Three or more members defined as at least one parent and children or student living at the same residence. But that doesn't work for everyone. It means as far as Marble is concerned, separated parents with children living in a different residence or single parents with one child are not families and don't qualify for the family rate. Don Lea is a single parent with one child. She bought ski passes at the early bird family rate, but Marble rejected her purchase, saying she must pay the regular early bird rate, and that's $150 more. It was really frustrating and disappointing. There are so many people in Western Newfoundland who want to use the facilities who are a family of two. And if that's what their stance is, they really can't call it a family rate. But that's not the case everywhere. The YMCA here in St. John's says one parent and one child is still a family to them, and they do get a discount. There's also another alternative to the way Marble Mountain charges families. 
The White Hills Resort near Clarenville also only offers family passes to families of three. But at White Hills, it's cheaper to buy a single adult pass and a single child pass than a family pass. There's no doubt that being a single parent can be tough and making ends meet can be at the top of the list of challenges. Some single parents say organizations should do what they can to cut single parents a break. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Well, former U.S. President Barack Obama is coming to St. John's. He'll be speaking on November 12th at a St. John's Board of Trade event as part of his public speaking tour. Tickets go on sale at noon on Monday at Mile One. The price ranges from $100 to $325. Obama served for two terms as the 44th President of the United States. Back to the program. First, we start with breaking news. Temperatures are dropping into the minus single digits. Time now to check in with our Carolyn Stokes. It is just packed with people. The company says it's picking up salmon. Looks like an absolutely gorgeous afternoon.
Welcome back, everyone. Now, before we get to uh, the weather, you may have noticed that uh, Jimmy Kimmel's obsession with a certain uh, town in this province is uh, back in the news. Yeah. Have you seen that? I did. I saw that, yeah. Yeah, you may <laughs> recall uh, that the late night comedian became the honorary mayor of Dildo a couple of months back. Well, a Newfoundland family ran into Kimmel when they were vacationing in New York. Just have a look. My people, we were just laughing it off, and it was, it was hilarious, it was so exciting. And my husband said, hey, we got to get some pictures with my wife. And so the three of us got together, we got our picture, he was awesome. I think this might have been the best selfie my husband had taken. <laughs> Exciting. He still hasn't come, though. No, not here no, yet. No, no, no word of him coming at all. Mm. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe he will. You never know. Yeah. Well, if he went to Labrador, he would see a very interesting uh, sight this morning. Yeah, it certainly would. Uh, you know, we're a week away from Halloween now, mm -hmm. but uh, it kind of looked like we were a week away from uh, Christmas. Take a look at this photo. Oh. This was uh, sent to us from Lab West. Beautiful though. It is, but I'm just not ready for snow. <laughs> Don't worry. It's not here anytime soon. Yet, at least not in the forecast. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, about five centimeters of snow fell this uh, last night into this morning, and it was about nine millimeters of precipitation. So that just means the snow was really wet. So probably good for making some snowmen, maybe even a snow pumpkin. Uh, but I doubt that it'll last for the next week or so. But uh, here's a look at those temperatures. So quite cool still up through Lab City. Four degrees right now as we speak. Eight degrees in St. John's and Badger sitting around 11 degrees right now. And uh, you can see, mentioned it a little bit earlier, but we seem to have escaped the showers for most of the Avalon today. But we are looking at some cloud cover through the night tonight and generally cloudy up through Labrador as well. Those winds that we saw a little bit earlier are going to ease as we head through the night tonight. About 25 kilometer per hour with gusts upwards of about 40 kilometers per hour for most of us across the island. And then they're just going to pick right back up again tomorrow night. Not, not nearly as windy as we saw today, but it will still be a little bit breezy through the afternoon. So here's a look at tonight. We will see some showers develop by the early morning hours, especially along the west coast. Parts of central will likely see a few uh, clear breaks overnight tonight. Uh, we do have that chance of showers up through Lab City. And then again, for central Labrador, you're looking at that chance of some showers through the night tonight. So here's a look at your temperatures. Not really moving a whole lot. Seven degrees in St. John's overnight tonight. Corner Brook, again, seven degrees. That chance of showers along the west coast. Eight for Portabasque. And then six degrees for St. Anthony tonight up through Labrador. Four degrees for Cartwright and then similar temperature for Happy Valley Goose Bay. That temperature will hover around the zero degree mark. You're going to hold on to those cool temperatures. So the showers will change over or will likely change over to uh, some flurries overnight tonight for Lab City or parts of Lab West. Now tomorrow, those showers along the West Coast will spread across the island. We'll more than likely see cloudy periods through the day. Some sunshine for parts of the Avalon as well. And then unsettled up through Labrador as far as some showers go. We could see some showers through the day, certainly for central and along the coast. But overall, just some sun and cloud through the day. So not a whole lot going on. But those temperatures will be quite nice for most of uh, the Avalon. 12 degrees for St. John's, 13 in Fairyland with those winds out of the west at 30 kilometers per hour. Those warm temperatures or mild temperatures rather uh, will stick around through central as well. More than likely a little bit more cloud cover for you with that chance of showers through the day. Certainly along the uh, west coast, 9 degrees for Corner Brook, 20 to 40 kilometer per hour winds, and then 8 degrees up through Cartwright. Again, looking at that chance of showers through the day. Happy Valley Goose Bay, you're looking at a little bit more sunshine through the afternoon with some scattered showers and then holding on to those cool temperatures for Lab City. Zero degrees tomorrow with that chance of flurries. Now, I showed you those warm temperatures for the island. We are in for a little bit of cool down as we head through the weekend. I'll have all those details coming up. Thanks, Ashley. The provincial branch of the Nature Conservancy of Canada is celebrating tonight. It's finally able to protect hundreds of acres of land donated for conservation. The land around Freshwater Bay was donated by the Crosby family, but that was just the beginning. Here and now, Cease Hare explains. Freshwater Bay to the right of the Narrows as you leave St. John's is known for whales, seabirds and icebergs. And the land around it with its hiking trails is extremely popular too. 
Two years ago, the Crosby family, through their company, Crosby Group Limited, donated 243 acres of land in the area. We kind of checked it against our, our checklist of um, what we call biodiversity targets, essentially things we want to protect. Uh, and with its forest and wetlands and seabirds off the side of it, um, we you know decided that yes, it was of great conservation value and also has a lot of recreational value. Um, so at that point, we agreed and, and the Crosby family generously um, signed an agreement to donate the land to us. Lafferty says since then they've raised a half a million dollars needed to complete the deal for transaction fees and to ensure long-term care and management. This ownership transfer puts an end to a proposed development of the area in the late 1980s. 34 years ago, companies planned to build an offshore oil service center in Freshwater Bay, a center where supply boats would load food, water, drilling mud quickly. The claim then was growing vessel traffic in St. John's Harbor would slow down the supply boat traffic, so a service center outside the Narrows was the way to go. Clearly, the idea never made it off the drawing board. The donated land, stretching from the rocky Barishwa in the bay to Blackhead Road, is now set aside for those who love nature and those who want to study it. Many students find our projects um, to be good research sites. You know, they're, they're properties that will stay the way they are for years to come, so long-term studies can be uh, helpful. Uh, also with locations across the island, uh, they can get different study areas. So we're really hoping, uh, especially with this site's proximity to you know, Memorial University, but also schools of all levels, um, that it's an opportunity for people to have a bit of an outdoor classroom. The land is zoned industrial, and the NCC says its first move will be to change that. Cease hair CBC News, St. John's. Well, from nature to technology, if you've used the internet, you've probably used Wikipedia. But what does Wikipedia have to say about this province? A group is uh, typing away as we speak, making sure our art and culture are included. And here now is Jeremy Eaton is at the AC Hunter Library in St. John's. Jeremy. Yeah, so we're hanging out in a place filled with books as people are logging onto the computers to fill out an online resource, which is kind of interesting, but it's an important one. And the, the idea for this Newfoundland Labrador Wikipedia Editathon came from Newfoundland Quarterly's Joan Sullivan, who joins us. Joan, thank you very much. Oh, thanks for being here. It's great. So why did you want to do this? Why did you want to host this little event? Because um, there's a lot of gaps in Wikipedia on Newfoundland culture, and it's actually very easy to become a Wikipedia editor. And our idea is to get a bunch of people with the, the interest in the subject together, give them the tools to do that, and then they can go off, they can do it on their own, they can form their own groups to do it, and they can concentrate on whatever issues particularly appeal to them. So why was it important for you to organize this? Why is it important to preserve Newfoundland and Labrador art and culture on a site like Wikipedia? It's such a resource. It is the fifth most frequently visited site globally. That's where everybody goes when, when they say who was that actor, what, what film were they in, and who wrote that book, and what year did this happen? They go to Wikipedia first time. Everybody knows it's a little unstable factually, you know, you have to be careful, but it's a great start to learning about whatever subject, and what better subject than Newfoundland land or culture? None. That's a good point. Now, so what did you do when people showed up here tonight? Uh, what did you do with them? Uh, like, did you walk them through them, signing up for accounts? So, sort of, what happened when people showed up yeah, here tonight? It's a step by step process to how to become an editor, how to uh, make a citation, how to make a link, how to expand text, um, how the layout of the page from the brief synopsis up on, on the top to the different categories that the Wikipedia itself will generate when you put the material in. And then everybody just started playing with the different pages. So there's a few people, a number of people showed up here tonight. Is this sort of something you'd like to do it again? Would you like to see this sort of grow to see more people getting involved so that we preserve more of our culture on this massive website? Yes, I, absolutely. So does it, I'd love to do more events like this again, but also people can just get together in a coffee shop and do it or online. You don't have to physically be together. Um, so have you, do you use, do you use Wikipedia a lot yourself? Yes. Like how often would you say that you would log on to this website? Three times a day. <laughs> yeah. and can I ask you a personal question? What sort of things are you looking up? Uh, what sort of things interest Joan Sullivan? Well, for example, I recently wrote about Anne Hart, the, the librarian that passed away, and my starting point was just because I start to get with her birthday and uh, her major awards, all that kind of stuff, I start there. But on a personal level, I, you are always going, you know, what was that movie and Buddy was in it and the girl? <laughs> 
and you, you know, that's where you go and find that information. And uh, uh, for some reason, I was looking up some stuff about President Buchanan earlier this morning. But anyway, that was, yeah. <laughs> Well, I uh, appreciate your time. Thank, thanks well, so much thank for joining us, Joan, so and much. thanks so much for putting this together and taking the time to chat to us. And uh, I was just uh, chatting with Joan about Wikipedia, and Carolyn, uh, you'll be pretty sad to know that neither you nor I have a Wikipedia page, okay, but, we'll fix that. <laughs> but maybe we can all change that. <laughs>Welcome back. Well, if you've been on social media this week, you've probably noticed Newfoundland and Labrador became a punching bag for some people angry with the results of Monday's election, with West Coasters doing much of the mudslinging. But what do people in Alberta think of it all? Here and now's Peter Cowan put that question to Melanie Thomas, a political scientist at the University of Calgary. A lot of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians are wondering, why is this hatred directed towards them?
Well, first off, I need to say that it is patently unfair, uh, and I think it's particularly in bad taste because Newfoundland and Labrador, as well as a number of other provinces in Atlantic Canada, know what it's like better than Albertans, what it is to do a very quick and harsh transition when a fundamental key industry collapses. So I've been looking at this with some distress and horror, um, but I think there are a few things to keep in mind that might explain why this is happening in a context where it's otherwise inexplicable. And for me, what helps explain it is a particular kind of partisanship. And so I want to say, first of all, that it's being a partisan is not a bad thing. And being feeling, really, feeling very strongly about your party is also not a bad thing. But what I think we're seeing here is a context where people have adopted their partisanship as a social identity. And in that, there's an emotional process that comes along where people see their party uh, as like if there's anything that is perceived to threaten the status of their party or their emotions are tied really closely to their party's fortunes. And so I think people are reacting from a polarized partisan place and they're feeling emotions on the part of their party. So if it was a positive outcome, there would be this euphoria, but because it's not the outcome that was expected or hoped for, there's a really strong negative reaction. And I think that's where the lashing out comes from. What do you think though is really driving Newfoundland and Labrador in particular to be the target because when you look at the argument seven seats here isn't going to have a big impact even in a minority environment you know even if every seat had gone conservative here the landscape would look very much the same exactly and I think what's going on is this idea of conflating energy in general in Canada with oil and gas and particularly with oil and gas from Alberta and so it's resting on a lot of stereotypes about uh, people from Newfoundland and Labrador coming and working out in the oil patch uh, up by Fort McMurray. Now what's interesting about this is that when we ask Albertans how important they think oil and gas in, is in particular is for Alberta's prosperity, 70% of Albertans will tell us that it's very important for Alberta, while only 24% will say that it's um, important for their own personal prosperity. So what I see in this case is that it's extended beyond people who are directly connected to oil and gas into this question of identity and that pull the emotions and stuff into it as well. Is this just a one-time outburst where people have strong emotions and they may be saying something out online without a filter, or is this a longer-term issue? Should we be more concerned about this and actually doing something to try and deal with the, this perception? So I wish I could say that I thought this was a short-term burst of aggravation, but what I think is actually going on is that this is a... Um, political tool that's being used very effectively for other purposes. And so one of the ways that I am thinking about why all of this narrative about Alberta being so angry has been coming out now when the partisan distribution of the seats that Alberta sent to Ottawa is a, roughly the same as what it's been since 1972. In this case, 2015 was the outlier, not this particular election. So I'm finding it interesting that this narrative that Canada is now so divided because Alberta is angry, narrative to be one that doesn't necessarily have a lot of evidence to suggest that there's been a big shift and the thing is, in the short term, it is a really effective political tool for those who are using it. And so this is my fear that this is not going to go away anytime soon. I do think the aggravation directed at Newfoundland and Labrador was an unintended consequence of that. I think that the target that people are expecting Albertans to direct this at is, is the federal government. Uh, I was taken aback by the targeting of Newfoundland, um, but I'm not surprised that that got brought into the mix either. Well, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us today. Thank you. And that was here now as Peter Cowan speaking with Melanie Thomas, who teaches voting behavior at the University of Calgary. That's where we reached her earlier today. A new mentorship program was launched today to help people living with a disability explore different occupations, passions, or skills. It's called Mentorability, and the launch happened at a St. John's Pool Hall. We stopped by to find out more. We're very excited to launch our Mentorability program as part of the employment supports that we have at our organization. So it's an opportunity for people to come in, have a game of pool, and maybe get paired up with a mentor. Uh, somebody who can talk to them about the job that they have. Uh, the tournament is a way to allow everybody to participate. We decided to come on board because pool is an excellent um, 
uh, sport for people of all abilities. Um, so we wanted to come on board and launch a new doubles program, mentor program for people with disabilities. The sport is excellent for people of all abilities, all walks of life, no matter what your background is or what your story is, you can come in, find a sense of community um, and just a home and comfort zone within the pool league. I think it's a great idea and I think it's something that could have been used many years ago because there's a lot of persons out there with disabilities um, who got a lot of abilities besides you might only have one disability like as for myself I have the disability called arthrogryposis which affects my joints and muscles and ligaments but I might not be able to climb the poles to do to do be a linesman for nuclear power but I can work in their office and I've gone to a lot of job interviews and the employers would say we feel like you would be a liability to our company it's like how can they say I'm a liability to your company if you don't give me the opportunity to prove that I can do other things? So has, has having a mentor to guide you along and to see that you do have other abilities besides what your disability is, is um, beneficial to everybody. For a while, from, for a few years actually, um, before, I used, I used to think, what's the point of even applying? What's the point of even trying? You're going to shut me down even before I walk into the door. you got all these able-bodied people who are given the first priority, even though they might not do the job so well as well I can do, but I'm not given the chance to show that I can do the job because of my disability. I've had an opportunity for people to say, this is what I do and I'm going to share the information and maybe with that information you can make a career choice. It's about giving people more opportunity to understand what a job really is in a particular area. So if you're a doctor or if you're a mechanic or if you're a pipe fitter, it's an opportunity. What are the skills involved with those? jobs and how would I learn about those skills and so this is really a, a national part of a national program that we've linked up with uh, all the other provinces and we're one of the places that are offering an opportunity for people to link up and find out what jobs are out there and how can I get more information. Just uh, having a search here to see uh, what from Newfoundland and Labrador is on Wikipedia and maybe some things that they could add. Now we're going to hear from somebody from the Centre for Newfoundland Studies about what's happening online coming up after the break.
Welcome back to Here and Now. We're hanging out at the Arts and Culture Center, the AC Hunter Library at the Arts and Culture Center, learning all about a Newfoundland Labrador Wikipedia edit a thon. And with me now is Jenny Higgins from the Center for Newfoundland Studies. Jenny, because I'm going to screw it up, what is your, what's your job title there? I am the Wikipedian in residence at the Center for Newfoundland Studies. What's a Wikipedian in residence mean? What does that mean, Jenny? Um, so I am going to lead Wikipedia edit-a-thons and I'm going to teach people how to use Wikipedia and increase and improve Newfoundland and Labrador content using really good reference materials from the Center for Newfoundland Studies and other libraries like this one here we're in today. So this job, is this a new job? When was this created and when did you get in, when did you jump into it? Yeah, uh, two weeks ago, okay. I, st <laughs> I started this job. It's a part-time job. I started two weeks ago. So uh, yeah, I'm very busy already at my first edit-a-thon. Well, we just realized that there was a former, I won't say his name, a former uh, Lieutenant Governor who's not on it that you said you had to add to your list. Yeah. How, how long is that list and what sort of things are on it, Jenny? Right now, the list is about three pages. Um, the Newfoundland and Labrador Folk Festival is not on Wikipedia. So that to me was very surprising. But we also have a lot of existing articles that are flagged for not having adequate citations. So if they don't have that, an editor in, you know, on the other side of the planet might remove that article from Wikipedia. So it's important for us to add citations to existing articles too. Is this, it's, it, the list is probably long and it's only going to grow longer. Is, is this sort of a, a challenge you're excited about embracing? Because it seems that we, Newfoundland Labrador has a lot of culture. Wikipedia is a massive site. Uh, so you're you prepared to do a lot of work over the next little while? I'm prepared to do a lot of work. Um, yeah, I am excited about it. Before I came here, I wrote for the Newfoundland and Labrador Heritage website, uh, which was basically an encyclopedia of Newfoundland and Labrador history and culture. So I do have a very general and broad knowledge, and I'm pretty excited to fill the gaps in Wikipedia because so many people use it. I mean, Google, if you Google anything, Wikipedia is going to be in the top three returns, right? So yeah, I do. I find this very exciting. Now, I know you're, you're a published author but, author, but you've also worked in the library for a little while. Is that correct? Yeah, I've worked in a library, in a circulation desk, also as a researcher. I've also worked in an archive. <laughs> so how important is this Wikipedia tool to first-year students, so to university students this day and age, as opposed to when I went to university and when you went to university, when we actually had to go look it up in the books? Yeah, um, I would say Wikipedia is very important to students like high school students, university students. It's a really good entry point for starting research, not an end point. So this is where you can go to sort of get your general idea of, okay, what's this topic about? And you can check the references at the end of the Wikipedia article, and those would be to books and encyclopedias, which would then be in libraries like this one, and also the QE2 library at Munn, and then you get those secondary, very high caliber uh, materials, which you would read to check to get the information. So Wikipedia, excellent starting point, and then go to your libraries and do your research. <laughs> All right, well, I appreciate your time. Thanks so much for yeah, joining us, Jenny, you. and I know you, uh, you have you know, people here still editing, so I'll let you get back to it. And uh, Carolyn, you and I are still not there yet, but Aww. maybe I'll become an editor and, <laughs> and I'll create a page for create a page for you. <laughs> well, I'm amazed that the Folk Festival wasn't there, so it, clearly a lot of work needs to be done. <laughs> yeah, we just went through, we did a quick little search and there's a few things that are not there, but there is a lot there. So, uh, but if you want to help out, I'm sure you can become an editor and go online and check in at the CNS and uh, they'll help you out. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jeremy. I wonder if this next show is on Wikipedia. Our colleagues at On The Go, the afternoon show on CBC Radio with Ted Blades are celebrating a big milestone. It's their 50th anniversary. On The Go went on the air in 1969 and is still informing audiences during the drive home time slot today. Here's a look at how the team is marking the anniversary. Good afternoon, my name is Ted Blades. Welcome to On The Go and the year 1969. Richard Nixon is President of the United States and some guy named Trudeau is Prime Minister of Canada. So some things haven't changed, but almost everything else has. For the next two hours, we'll celebrate On The Go's 50 years on the air and we're gonna party like it's 1969. Oh,
cabinet is supposed to be, uh, if not a, a meeting of equals, a, a meeting of people relatively equal to, to come up to a group decision on how to govern, how to make, how to move forward on some issue. With Joey in the room as the premier, what was that like? Well, Joey was uh, governed by whim, you know, whatever occurred to him that morning when he got out of bed, good, bad, or indifferent, that's what became the policy of the day. So people like myself and Roberts and others involved in the government, Bill Callahan, for example, John Mahoney, people like that, we spent our time uh, trying to hold back the floodwaters of Joey's brainwaves. Now, luckily, because John Crosby and Clyde Wells and uh, Alec Hickman and others had left Joey's cabinet, Joey had no, no uh, room to maneuver. So he couldn't threaten to kick us out because then he'd have nobody. So we were able to withstand most of the mad schemes that were coming up. But even so, trying to deal with John C. Doyle, and John Shaheen, come by chance refinery, the liner board mill, that was no picnic. Welcome back. Well, we're inching closer and closer to the weekend. Tomorrow is Friday. How's it looking? Tomorrow, uh, yeah, tomorrow is Friday already. Holy. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a look at that forecast. Uh, just caught me off guard a little bit there, even though it's been <laughs> Thursday all day. Uh, 12 degrees is the afternoon high tomorrow for St. John. So a good start to the weekend as far as those temperatures go. But again, going to hang on to those cooler temperatures up through Lab City. Zero degrees for you and that chance of shower or uh, flurries will be through the afternoon. Now we do have some cooler air on the horizon and that's because of where the jet stream is going to be over the next or at least over the weekend. So we're going to see a really big dip in the jet stream. That's going to funnel some of that colder Arctic air. Now it's going to moderate itself, so it's not going to be that cold, but we are still looking at below seasonal temperatures uh, through most of the weekend. But the good news is, is that cold air retreats further uh, back north and we're going to see a big ridge in the jet stream and that's going to bring in some warmer air as we head into midweek next week. And it looks like it'll take us into uh, at least parts of the weekend. We are, we do have uh, Halloween 
uh, next week. So hopefully these warmer temperatures will stick around as well. So here's a look at what the future tracker is showing. A little bit of uncertainty as far as what the weekend will be as of now, but we do have some flurries moving through. So this will take us through again on Friday, but into Saturday, we do still have the influence of that low pressure system that's sitting offshore. So more than likely going to see some showers to start the day on Saturday. The ridge of high pressure is in behind us and just how strong that is will determine how much sunshine we see through the weekend. So as of now, it does look like some cloudy periods through the day on Saturday. Still can't rule out that chance of showers for central and eastern Newfoundland through the day. And then that chance of showers and or flurries along coastal areas of Labrador as well. Otherwise, it looks like we should see a mix of sun and cloud. Sunday right now is when it looks like we'll take hold of that low pressure or uh, rather high pressure system. So a little bit more sunshine in the forecast, certainly for Lab West and through Central and then parts of Western Newfoundland as well. But again, uh, we could see some coastal areas of some showers and maybe even some drizzle or fog, depending on uh, how just how uh, that low pressure or high pressure rather takes uh, force over us. So here's a look at uh, what we're going to see on Saturday. Those temperatures are going to dip, like I mentioned, seven degrees for St. John's uh, and then plenty of sunshine up through Labrador. Now over the next five days, here's where we're looking. So sunshine uh, by the time Monday and Tuesday rolls around, we'll see a little bit of bump up in those temperatures, as I mentioned. Same thing for central Newfoundland, double digits. It looks like by Tuesday, your overnight lows uh, minus unfortunately. And then for Western Newfoundland, you're looking at sunshine right from Sunday pretty much until Tuesday as that ridge of high pressure takes hold. And then up through uh, Eastern Labrador, seasonal temperatures for Saturday and Sunday. And then we go back up to those temperatures as well. And then for Western Labrador, seasonal by Saturday, which is zero degrees. And then you're going to bump up above seasonal for the beginning of next week. Well, we want to know where you're to. This beautiful fall shot was sent to us. I'll tell you where it is when we come back.
Medical experts have long warned that bees, crucial to agriculture, are in serious decline. A California expert has come up with a solution that could help. He wants to reintroduce the kind of wild habitat bees used to live in before massive domestication. Yeah, he calls it rewilding and is generating a lot of buzz. And here's a man who loves bees almost as much as Carolyn. <laughs> We set up hives, we prepare them so they're really attractive to honeybees and uh, to scouts, and then we just watch them move in. They are circulating air, and so the air coming out here. It sometimes makes me so emotional because yeah. it's almost as if honeybees make the fragility of life so palpable, and as if they are really mirroring yeah, where we are in this time on this planet. We can do this very, very simple thing. Return bees into their natural nest environment, into their natural biosphere, because we need to do everything we can to protect them. If we lose them due to human-induced mass extinction, will there be a tomorrow? Oh, love him. <laughs> Something to think about. <laughs> but before we go, we'll show you this uh, gorgeous photo. I guessed it. Yep, Bowering Park. Ray Stanford <laughs> sent us that gorgeous shot. It will definitely go out on that. We'll leave you. Good for night. For this evening. <laughs> Thanks for watching, everyone. Good night.